evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to speak on a debate so close to home. With a name such as Geneva, yes, <laughs> that is indeed my real name, I am somewhat accustomed to being consistently asked the questions, do your parents work at the UN? Were you born in Switzerland? Or were you named after that convention? <laughs> Unfortunately, although none of these questions are followed with the answers, yes, how did you guess? <laughs> the UN, as a result, is something that I am all too familiar with. And it is with this familiarity that I know the United Nations isn't perfect. There are reasons to think that it is subject to power struggles, just as this particular institution is, especially at this time of year. There are also reasons to think that it does not lead to a utopia or towards a utopian world government accountable to each and every citizen. Indeed, as Proposition very well has and will continue to argue, to wish for global cooperation in a global order that, def that defaults to de facto anarchy is somewhat naive. But ladies and gentlemen, it is this dedication to naivety that has meant life as we see it isn't as nasty, as brutish, or as short as it once was. It is not as nasty, as brutish, or as short for the many who have benefited through UN development aid programs when their government gave them nothing. It is not for those whose rights were protected by UN peacekeepers when civil wars and terrorist groups were determined to take those rights away. For the generations who seek to benefit from UN climate treaties, signed to tackle one of the biggest problems our, for our world will ever face. Life is improving, albeit at times slowly and not as fast as we would like it to. For millions who benefit from the WHO's advisory support and research into vaccines and cures for diseases like COVID-19 outbreak right now. Life is indeed better for those whose security is enshrined under the promises of the Security Council. Life is better for humanity because of the UN. It is easy to take these things for granted and to focus on the flaws and errors, the ineptitude and the blunders. But we cannot and should not forget what the world looked like during the times when the United Nations did not exist. What the world would look like under side proposition. Proposition needs to demonstrate the following key claims in order for the motion to stand tonight. Firstly, they must demonstrate that global cooperation does not exist and is hence an illusion. To say that something is an illusion is to argue that it does not exist or that it exists in a way that is deeply incongruent with its public perceptions. Note, this is not about whether we think we should do better or whether or not the UN's promised objectives have been achieved, but whether, trivially speaking, cooperation is not existent. Secondly, if they somehow manage to pass that burden of the first claim, they must prove why the UN is actively fueling said illusion, that it is itself responsible for the misplaced and exaggerated expectations that some individuals on side proposition bench may hold towards it. I posit that both of these claims are false, and I will bring you three arguments today to prove that this is true. Somewhat surprising, I know, Yes, I am indeed a competitive debater. <laughs> Argument number one. I will firstly prove that the UN has facilitated a wide range of international collaboration and that these very ventures, while at times imperfect and flawed, both operate and generate benefits on a global scale. Secondly, I shall discuss how the UN has empowered countries to make strides and leaps towards better domestic governments because I posit that a prerequisite for global cooperation is domestic stability. And the UN has done that, even if at times imperfectly. And thirdly, I will explain why the UN's symbolic significance is uniquely irreplaceable by alternative contenders that proposition must stand behind tonight. Whether it be the EU, NATO or ASEAN, these means that even if we grant the reforms to the UN that are necessary, it still has succeeded in uniquely contributing towards global cooperation. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I will close with a question over our search for utopia and whether this unrealistically high expectation 
that proposition will inevitably hold the UN to should be the standards that which you judge this debate at all. But first, it does fall upon me to introduce the speakers on side proposition tonight. And unlike Beatrice, I will indeed try my hand at some student budget rate comedy. <laughs> <laughs> you first just heard from Beatrice Barr, a second year history and politics student at St. Peter's College. I, I was slightly surprised to hear B, as librarian of the Oxford Union, to speak on the proposition tonight, to call for the failure of an institution that does not live up to the expectations people continuously place on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, as B knows all too well, an imperfect institution is not an institution we shouldn't have faith in, one we shouldn't devote time to, one we shouldn't believe serves a purpose, or one we indeed should not run for president for. <laughs> in the end, the UN really is the one. And for those of you who don't quite get, get that humour, I invite you to eagerly await her hack message later tonight. <laughs> Secondly, speaking on side proposition, is Charles Petrie. He has held multiple positions within the United Nations and has worked on countless missions in Sudan, Rwanda, the Congo, Afghanistan, and Myanmar, where his work has helped to prevent conflicts and rebuild post-conflict societies. I think we are all indebted greatly to Charles and the UN for making a difference for the world in which we live in today. Nevertheless, I am slightly confused to see him sitting on proposition bench tonight, <laughs> given that his very existence and achievements are certainly proof for the opposition case. <laughs> Finally, concluding the side for proposition bench today is Andrew Gilmore, the United, UN's Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. One look at Andrew's LinkedIn will tell you that Andrew has lived a life of adversity, adversity, which has prepared him well for fighting for the world's poorest. Having attended both Eton and been a student at Balliol College, <laughs> where Andrew gets his humanity from really does cease to amaze me. <laughs> On a more serious note, however, his exceptional work with the, United, uh, with the Human Rights Upfront Initiative serves as an inspiration for us all and his work in paving the way for global cooperation is indeed unparalleled. Madam President, these are your speakers, and they are indeed most welcome. Now on to my first argument, which concerns the existence of intergovernmental and international collaboration under the United Nations. Is it reasonable to assume that surely proposition won't deny the existence of these benefits. They will merely say that their successes are not the result of the UN or of genuine cooperation. So I will take on the higher burden and show why these solely can be attributed to the UN and reflect true, genuine cooperation. Let us start with the United Nations Security Council, a force for peace in the modern world, the light side of the force, if you will. <laughs> A 2005 RAND Corporation found that, uh, study found that the UN is successful in two out of its three peacekeeping efforts, and that seven out of the eight cases the UN makes to state build have resulted in general peace. Albeit, I may have ceased to study mathematics in every case possible, but even I can tell those are good ratios. In the aftermath of the Cold War, the UN spearheaded critical peacekeeping operations in Namibia, Cambodia, Mozambique, and El Salvador. Such operations drew from both sides of the then collapsed Berlin Wall, with the Soviet Union and the USA coming to consensus over the broad terms of the peace settlements. Since then, the UN missions have restored broadly inclusive political processes, advanced general disarmament, and pushed for reconciliation in these countries. Obviously, there are setbacks, I won't tell you tonight that there aren't. For one, Cambodia is no perfect democracy, and there are issues, uh, there are concerns about its leadership succession. Yet, who was that actor that pulled all these countries back from the brinks of collapse and civil warfare? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it was the UN. More recently, the UN's contributions and operations in the Ivory Coast have seen a substantial stabilization of the country's political situation. 
With soldiers drawn from countries ranging from Bangladesh to France, the mission has been pivotal in, in protecting civilians against insurgents and against terrorists, as well as pushing the former rebels into civil war and an Ivory government to come to the table and for the first time engage in negotiations. Of course, I cannot win this debate based on examples of, uh, alone. My time as a debater has certainly taught me that. For instance, what happened in former Yugoslavia, particularly in Kosovo, was no doubt a tragedy. The UN has also not been hugely successful in addressing the Rohingya crisis or the Central African Republic, or many other examples that I'm sure Proposition will bring to you tonight. However, under Proposition's side, these crises are no closer to resolution. In fact, they are only further away. There is clearly an element of cooperation which the UN uniquely provides. Had it not been for the Security Council or the UN institutions, countries would not have been found sufficient incentives to come together and invest in long-term peace pacts and agreements concerning countries that they have absolutely no direct interest in. More impressively, perhaps, is the international efforts coordinated under the WHO during the 1970s effort to eradicate smallpox, one of the most lethal diseases in human history. As the first disease to have been brought on a global scale, this disease took doctors from all countries and global medical talents to construct and implement vaccine programs, surveillance and prevention measures in order to eliminate the illness in both Africa and Asia. Was this global cooperation? Ladies and gentlemen, I say it was. It featured document adopters from all inhabited continents and who were funded by capital, both privately donated and publicly contributed by the WHO members. Maybe we could talk about, however, the elephant in the room, climate change. Perhaps Proposition's case almost seems strongest here. The UN could do more. Isn't it all talk and no action? But I want you all to remember that talk can indeed lead to action. It can be crucial for making that action actually act. Because being, raising awareness and applying critical pressure on politicians may not yield immediate impacts, but without the UN's efforts and lobbying governments and creating an atmosphere where politicians, save maybe for perhaps Trump and the Republican Party, would feel embarrassed to deny climate change, we would be in a far, far worse situation. The 2013 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change provided substantially more clarity about which activities contribute to the most and least likely eventuating in climate change. It extracted insights from the research of leading scientists and produced advice that policymakers could transform into genuine decisions. It also provided a powerful signal to philanthropists and private donors. I dare say that this is global cooperation, which has been incredibly far-reaching. Global impacts which have reached across the world. But it also features a partnership of various different countries. Proposition may attempt to convince you that it isn't cooperation if it's unilateral or if it's imposed asymmetrically. After all, if the UN's decisions are handed down and smaller nations have no say, surely this cannot be cooperation after all. But this ignores the fact that the UN agencies are some of the most representative bodies in the entire world, with representatives from smaller nations playing a critical role in senior leadership, but also with a constant rotation to put the smallest countries in the most important positions. Pat, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important cooperation which the UN has been unique in providing. Secondly, though, the United Nations has made leaps and strides in transforming domestic governments and politics. The UNDP is among the most transparent aid associations in the world, spending millions of dollars into funding security system reform, disease management, public sector policy, disaster relief, and the list really does go on. Again, the UNDP relies on expertise and knowledge of its highly international workforce and is funded by the United Nations 100 and 93 permanent members. Through export-driven policy making that seeks to incorporate domestic voices, the UNDP has played a pivotal role in reforming governments in Latin America and East Africa, 
pushing countries such as Mali, Madagascar, and to Togo to migrate towards smooth and open elections, as well as empowering countries such as Brazil or Guatemala to develop sustainable and inclusive education systems that cater to the many, not to the, poor, not to the small. Obviously, the UNDP is by no means perfect, but we cannot let perfect be the enemy of good. We cannot let strive for the perfection blind us from the progress which is made along the way. But why are these examples of global cooperation? Firstly, it is because, global, because it is global because it highlights the interconnectivity within UN. Countries chip in resources, institutional knowledge, and personnel towards the international organization in exchange for de facto advice, support, and coordination. There is so much more, ladies and gentlemen, to be done. But let's not for one second forget how far we have come since the end of World War II. Finally, my third argument is that much of what the UN has achieved is remarkable and uniquely attributable to its achievements and successes. The proposition may argue tonight that other international or regional organizations, such as the EU, ASEAN, the African Union, or even NATO, can take the place of the UN through creating peace and continental development in our world. However, there are two key factors that this argument dares to overlook. The first is that no other international organization has structures anywhere near as equalitarian or representative in terms of voting procedures, required representation, or constitutional guarantees under the Charter. An example of this is the UN General Assembly, which grants equal voting rights and speaking rights to every member state, no matter how big, no matter how small. Secondly, no other body has sought to develop an articulation of human rights and political freedom that has been, as much as possible, cognizant of the interests and needs of vastly different communities. The incentive of these alternative organisations are vastly different from those of the UN, and the voices they platform simply do not compare. The reality is that the United European Union does not include nations that can incorporate the perspective of developing or failing states, and its development programmes are certainly not for everyone. Similarly, NATO will always provide, prioritise the security interests given it is a military organisation. Despite its flaws, no other organisation can take its place. It may be said that the UN was founded upon over-ambitious goals, but it has definitely adapted and transformed itself in ways no other institutions ever could. The UN does not claim to be the be-all and end-all of the world's problems. It does not argue that with its existence, all is well and kumbaya. If we hold the UN to the metric of global peace and egalitarian order, of course it is destined to fail. But the very nature of utopian standards is such that nothing can ever quite reach them. We should remember that we do not live in the city of God. We live in an earthly city filled with bitter feuds and differences across countries. And while the UN has much room to improve, it reflects the best efforts of humans to unite together for a cause far greater than themselves. When you walk through those doors tonight, remember the UN is not designed to make the world into a utopia. It is designed to bring us that one step closer to a better world. A vote for opposition tonight is indeed a vote for that one step. Thank you.